Hi. In my last video, I talked about the problems with equating IQ and intelligence and tried to give a broad view of what intelligence is. But I don't usually talk about intelligence. I think it's really overrated. I'd rather have wisdom, happiness, and critical thinking, personally. But we don't learn those things at school. In fact, we don't learn those things anywhere unless we take control of our own learning. If we pushed aside all the things holding us back, we would have amazing abilities. If you Google it, you'll find a million games and explanations of how to be smarter by people who are presumably smart themselves. But none of the ones I've ever seen have focused on the systems that we live under. Change those systems, and we'll all be smarter. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Do you consider yourself a genius? Probably not. Most people are more modest than that. But what sets you apart from people we consider geniuses? Genius usually means the person had the opportunity to become famous, because otherwise we wouldn't have heard about them and been told they're a genius. People get called geniuses for making lots of money, even though sometimes that just means they had access to money in the first place. For our purposes, genius might mean the person who's worked long and intensely on something and knows it really well. That's what the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell is about. The most important part of that book is at the end where he basically says that with the right opportunities for everyone to learn and grow, there would be no more outliers. We would all be geniuses. I don't want to go too deep into the economic and political systems that restrain us, because that's what most of my other videos are about, and it would make this video much longer. Suffice it to say, I think it's obvious, if you've had all your money taken away, you have no freedom. If you're in jail, you might have a couple of books. If you're working all the time, you have no chance to do what you want. There are a million other constraints imposed by the systems we're forced to live under. It may be that we'll have to tear down all oppressive systems at the same time. Not just change schools or reform the police or feed the homeless or call out racists and hope it'll stick. I want all people to be geniuses, to reach their potential, and that will require major social change. But I think it's worth it. If you're not convinced, I've got lots more videos where I explain in detail. Here, I'm mostly going to talk about the limitations placed on us in childhood that we carry our whole lives. And throughout, I'll be giving examples of things you can do about it. I've made a whole playlist on school, and I link to it in the description. It's all about how school works, what it does to a child and why, and alternatives, how to educate children better. I suggest you watch it first, because I'm not going to repeat myself here. But I am going to talk about school. It's the main institution holding kids back from growing into geniuses. Of course, most people are forced by their work schedules and the law to send their kids to school. And I really sympathize because I don't know how you can get around those constraints. Maybe organizing with your neighbors? I don't know what resources are available to you. Some people like the idea of school because it forces children to learn. But children learn so much more when they're not being forced. If your question is, how do you force kids to learn everything they learn in school, you're asking the wrong questions. This video is about freeing the child to pursue their passions and thrive that way. Sure, there are some basic things that kids uh, should probably learn, like, I know it's a cliche, but reading, writing, and arithmetic are all still essential. But it begs the question to say they need to go to school to learn those things. 
A child could happily play math games for hours and because it's fun and engaging. They're learning way more effectively than if they were bored. There are all kinds of educational resources you can find online that make learning easy and fast. For example, you could teach them science and the scientific method. Plus, keep in mind what Carl Sagan said, that it's even more important to know the history of science than the method. You can learn all that stuff together. You could spend a day or a month on some medieval scientist, uh, replicate their experiments maybe, and then reenact the trial where they were condemned to death for saying that the moon wasn't God's nose or whatever. A lot of skills don't even need teachers. For example, kids need to know how to use a computer and navigate the internet, right? But if you have kids, do you teach them about technology or do they teach you? Did you ever have to sit them down and tell them how to use a smartphone? Or did they watch you and figure it out that way? It's like language. They observe it because they want to do it too. And as soon as you let them, they can begin to master it. Kids nowadays are landing planes with their phones. Anything can be like that if we get all unnecessary constraints out of the way. And there are way more constraints than you might realize. For one thing, I don't think we should be telling kids they're smarter than other kids. I see no value in that. In my experience, a lot of the people who were called smart in school and have grown up are really just better at justifying their beliefs. They believe the same thing as everyone else, but they're better at explaining why and coming up with educated reasons why they're right and their opponents are wrong. But that doesn't make them right. Intelligence as measured by grades and IQ scores doesn't necessarily lead to the truth. It often just leads to confidence. If the school system deems you intelligent, it might just mean you're better at absorbing propaganda. Where's the prize to the kid who questions the textbooks, or questions the teacher, or questions rituals like the Pledge of Allegiance? No, they're called troublemakers. Questions, critical thinking, working together, any application of intelligence outside the curriculum is not allowed. School's not an environment for geniuses. It's where genius goes into a coma. Most people are so crippled by school, they don't realize what they're capable of, so genius never wakes up. Your natural talents don't matter so much if they're not nurtured. But with the right environment, all those kids could be experts in their chosen fields. Our brains change a lot over our lifetimes. They change with everything we experience. So whatever we're born with, the right stimulation can bring out our potential. The brain of a child in an interesting and fulfilling learning experience changes in a really different way from that of a child sitting bored at a desk. Or, likewise, a child who's too poor to learn anything other than picking through garbage for something to sell. These children are stifled. Their brains don't reach their potential. Some of them might get the chance to grow up to be geniuses, but many won't. Because they didn't have the right environment, the right care and attention, or the right opportunities to learn. That's not their fault. I don't even blame their parents. The problem is the systems they grew up in. It's the systems that need to change. You may be familiar with what Stephen Jay Gould wrote in The Panda's Thumb. I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. Or just fell asleep in classrooms. As you may know from the single most popular TED Talk ever, children are at their creative peak before they go to school. School proceeds to squeeze the creativity, along with the joyful spirit, out of the child. Again, if you've seen my whole playlist on school, 
you'll know why, but even if not, you can probably figure it out. School tells you what to do and when and how and discourages you asking why. We're naturally curious, but school tells us to stop asking questions and get back to work. We're naturally social, but we get punished for talking to or working with others. We're natural scientists, but scientists need room to experiment, not desks they're not allowed to move from. And we need to move, walk, run, jump, and play. Kids make up their own games when you leave them alone. Or, in fact, even in a boring class, they'll make up games. But they're not allowed to be creative or have fun in class, so the teacher tells them to stop and listen. Kids should be exploring their abilities and interests, but they aren't. They're doing whatever the government, the school board, and the teachers tell them to do. And parents either don't know any better or don't have a choice. Leaving aside how useful, you know, algebra and the Bronte sisters are, students aren't even necessarily learning those things. They're trying to pass tests. The main incentive of the teacher is to get their students through the next test. Just like the main incentive of the CEO is to post good results in the next quarterly report. I think for the most part you don't need to measure a child's learning. And I certainly don't think all learning has to revolve around tests on paper. Where's the class on creativity? Working well with others? Critical thinking? Systems thinking? Lateral thinking? Not available. Wait till university, kid, then maybe. What's that? You have to look for a single answer? That's what we taught you in school. They're taught to look for the single correct answer to the question set by authority. So what they learn is to look for just one answer and seek a pat on the head. I haven't measured this. But I bet a year of reading books and Wikipedia, playing strategic sports and complex video games, and maybe taking online aptitude tests, because those are all great ways to stimulate your brain, would teach you more than you would learn from six months, uh, six years, sorry, in elementary school. And you wouldn't have to continually alternate between being bored and being stressed out. We also need to recognize the limits placed on children in the form of expectations for their futures. They're expected to think only about how they're going to make money. From the youngest age, we ask them, what do you want to do when you grow up? It seems innocent, but think of all the implications. You've, you've got to get a job. And you're supposed to only have one job that you train for, and you're supposed to start thinking about that job now as a child. And it's not really about what they want to do, because if what they want doesn't make enough money, they're supposed to forget about it. How do you want to make money? Not what would be useful to yourself and the world. Just make some money. That's how you should determine your worth, too by how much money you have. Find one thing, get good enough at it, then try to make enough money to buy a house and the rest of the middle class dream, and maybe you can find some time for yourself some afternoon in the future. Don't rest. Feel guilty for resting. You should be monetizing your hobbies, too. You know, to turn something you like into more work. Even your health doesn't matter. So live off ramen and stay up late to finish that assignment or project, maybe every night, as long as you accumulate qualifications and don't get fired. Just make some money and maybe you can buy health. Then at 65, you'll finally be able, allowed to stop working for someone else. It would be nice to have that kind of job security. That's what they're told their lives are supposed to be. Consider how limiting that is. We're not saying work together to solve social problems. Here's how to do that. We're telling kids what matters is 
building your resume and competing with your peers for jobs and money, with the only goal being unfathomably far into the future. In other words, work within and for the existing system and try to ignore everyone else. It's so ironic when people say, children are our future, and then proceed to train them to work in the present. The future is going to be really challenging for these kids. The ruling class and their supporters will try to maintain the same political and economic system, and that's going to require a lot of violence. Americans are seeing the beginnings of that violence now. Someone told me the other day 2020 is the first year of the 21st century. I agreed. So why are we still teaching 20th century subjects and a 19th century school system? Huh. Presumably to maintain the status quo. To do that, they have to limit kids as much as possible. And expectations are a huge part of that. Kids could be envisioning a better future and then working towards, a, working towards it with the rest of us, with their community. You know, if their lives didn't belong to the government. What's the value of being labeled a genius within such a restrictive system? My parents and teachers used to tell me I was smart or gifted as a child. Then when I got older and finally started using my brain for thinking rather than memorizing, they told me I was wrong and should shut up. However smart or gifted kids are, they're still not allowed to learn anything outside the limits of the curriculum. So in effect, they're not allowed to think. So what good does it do you to get called smart as a child? Well, it raises everyone's expectations of you, so now you're under pressure to keep up a high standard of grades. No one tells you grades don't even matter until your last couple of years of high school, and then only if you're going to university. But they'll be expected to go to university, even if they have a different idea of what they want to do, because they're supposed to accumulate qualifications, which of course are only means to making money. And after that, they'll be expected to get a job and make lots of money and pay off the loans they took out with the hope they would be making lots of money after they graduate. Most don't. So they begin their quarter-life crisis. They aren't where they were told they should be. So the reality of the world hits them hard. Some people take whatever shitty job is available, including McDonald's smelling of french fries all day to make some shareholders richer, or selling drugs, however likely it is that you're going to get thrown in jail because no one else around is hiring, or even joining the military, fighting in imperial wars because it pays better than anything else available to you. Some people get depressed and even suicidal because they were trained for a world that barely even exists anymore. They were told they were all going to be millionaires. Well, sorry, not everyone can be a millionaire. Capitalism doesn't work that way. Maybe kids should know that. Maybe. But of course, they never at any point in school study the system the way it actually works. So they grow up to watch videos like this and scoff. <laughs> the system. <laughs> They've been told their whole lives the system enables everyone to be free and rich. And if you're not, it's all your fault. So they believe it. Really, you should never have been taught that stuff in the first place. And you should have learned to demand and assess evidence. We can unlearn it all, but it's hard because we've accepted it as truth for as long as we can remember. The goals of schooling follow the goals of the ruling class who decide how schooling will go. They want obedient, police-fearing taxpayers who don't question that they're forced to work for someone else until they die. Their entire lives are structured by people who think of them as pawns, and they learn to accept it in school. Is that really why you send your kids to school? 
is that really what you want them to be? If not, don't send them to school. Or at least stop caring about homework and tests and grades and start listening to them. There are so many things you could be doing or learning that rarely get taught in school. Like, why do we never learn how to learn? Let me give you some tips on that. First, apply what you learn. For example, if you want to uh, know how to build a house, you can get people to teach you, maybe through YouTube videos even, but you have to apply what they tell you to do, not just watch. By the way, that's an example of choosing to follow an authority rather than being forced to accept it. But if you're reading a book and you want to remember all you read, that's different from construction. You don't remember the history of U.S. foreign policy by building it. But you can still apply what you read. You can ask questions while you read. Please ask questions while you read. It helps you engage with the material. Especially questions beginning with why. Asking why a lot is a good habit that kids have that they lose in school that we can all get back into. Everything you read you can fact check and that'll help you remember. You can look for patterns and that'll help you remember. And there are definitely patterns in US foreign policy. You can help to see patterns uh, by maybe comparing what you read with other sources um, on the same topic. You can um, compare one country's foreign policy with another's. You can make charts and mind maps to visualize things. You can use your imagination to remember things. Picture what you're reading about. Let your mind create a whole movie in detail, if you can. That's a really brief introduction to cognitive psychology. How to learn, how to remember, how to acquire a new language, how best to make decisions and solve problems, how kids develop. You can break all this down for kids without getting them to read dry textbooks, like by making the right cooperative games and then debriefing them afterwards. What did you learn? Why did you do it that way? Can you think of another way? Etc. This is the kind of thing you do in corporate team building exercises. And that's because it works. But schools aren't allowed to play games that lead to important life lessons like teamwork or vision or strategic thinking. <laughs> because those things are not in the curriculum. School is supposed to be serious. A serious place where kids do serious work and learn to be serious. Fun facilitates learning. But it's not allowed. Neither is movement. All of us, especially kids, think and remember better when we get the chance to move and exercise. Sitting at desks for long stretches is bad for our bodies and our brains. We should revamp the whole idea of teaching. You don't learn just because someone tells you stuff. That only works if you're opting into the class, like choosing to watch this video. And even, even in this case, there's no guarantee you'll remember. With a channel like this, I'm a lecturer of sorts, except being online changes the nature of a lecture to your advantage. You can rewind or pause to take notes or look things up or use your imagination to remember, or apply what I say to your life, or maybe your kid's life. Teaching depends on the student. A student at a beginner level needs you to hold their hand. My teaching experience is mostly with adults in teaching language, and if you don't know any English or whatever other language, I'll get you repeating after me and doing exactly what I want you to. If you're already at a high level, I might barely even talk. I might just listen, ask and answer questions, make corrections and suggestions. I might suggest a book that's challenging enough for you, then follow up every day or every week to see how you're doing. Because students might be at all different levels and abilities regardless of their age, teaching should not be one size fits all. But in a classroom, 
pretty much has to be. Employees of the school don't have the freedom to give students a real education. What would teaching look like? And what would your role be if, from the age of seven, your kid thinks they want to be a comedian? They would still learn the basics of life, the three R's and all that, but instead of a lot of things they don't need and don't care about, or just don't care about yet, they would learn how to be funny. You can study comedy. There are books and videos and classes. If they learn it and practice it, they can make a career out of it, starting way before the age of 18 or 22 or whenever they would otherwise finish an unnecessarily long stint in school. That's what it should mean to be gifted. Not that you're good at taking tests. And all of us have a gift, or really I should say gifts, because there's no reason you should assume that you can only excel in one thing. But instead of nurturing individual gifts, we set up all kids to be doctors. You like gardening and cooking? Yeah, we don't have any classes in that. Sorry. <laughs> Art? Yeah, you can take one elective a year. A sport you love to play? Huh, maybe after school and after all your homework. Or what if they love chemistry? Imagine a child, or better, a group of children, studying chemistry, conducting experiments, following their curiosity for years before going to university or wherever the next level is. We'd call them chemistry geniuses. Really, they're just passionate, and you moved out of the way. What if you think your child should be learning Shakespeare instead of doing what they want? Well, it's great to encourage them to read. Show them Shakespeare. If you know Shakespeare and you can teach it to them, then that's great. But if not, you could find someone else who knows it. Maybe just a YouTube channel. If the child likes it, keep going. If not, they can find something else. There's just as much value in deconstructing rap as there is in Shakespeare. If not more, because it's from now, not 400 years ago. But most schools would never deconstruct rap. They don't care about what children want or what would be useful. They care about tests. That's their institutional incentive. Schools are ranked by how students perform on tests. So teachers are ranked by how students perform on tests. That doesn't leave room for asking kids what they want, what they're good at, or what their opinions are. In fact, it makes it certain they won't learn what they want, and they will be bored. It's hard for me to imagine how awful it must be now for young students who are expected to sit in front of their computers, listening to everything some teacher says, not allowed to look away or do anything else regardless of how it numbs their brains. Students are still getting disciplined for inattention and disobedience, because that's the whole point of school, disciplining kids to follow instructions and conditioning them to have someone tell them what to do their whole lives. And schools are even punishing kids for, for the same nonsense as before. Parents are getting charged with neglect because their kids aren't logging on to pointless classes. And you presumably heard about the school that called the cops on a kid uh, because he was toying with a Nerf gun in the background of a Zoom class? Huh. And I'm sure his being black was just a coincidence. So putting school on Zoom is no more educational than having it in the classroom. If this is the best these schools and governments can propose, it's even more urgent that you get your kids out. Please see the third video in my playlist on education for how to do that. Now I've been talking about how to create geniuses from birth with no reference to what adults can do for themselves. Well, most of what I said applies to adults. They can still reject their indoctrination and follow their passions and form groups to learn what they want and answer questions and solve problems. They just probably won't have as much time because of so-called adult responsibilities. 
There are many forces holding us back. Some of those forces are beliefs given to us as kids that continue to limit us as adults. School doesn't just hold us back in various ways, but inculcates harmful beliefs about ourselves, about what we can and should do, making us feel guilty for drawing outside the lines or getting up without asking permission. That's not education for liberation. That's indoctrination for a life of service to the ruling class. So I say, reject their systems and the unnecessary constraints that come with them. Ultimately, the biggest barriers are in our own minds, set up by schools and parents and other authorities. But if they're in our minds, that means we can get rid of them. This channel exists to help you free your mind of other people's constraints. I hope this video has helped with that. Thanks.